Wow. We got some breaking news. Director Scott Derrickson, former director of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, says he left the film to <laughs> making, and I quote, a monstrosity. Yes, this oh, boy. as we were uh, making your favorite podcast, ladies and gents. So I thought we would take a look at this. Um, I mean, it just dropped, I mean, it, yeah, it dropped during this show, basically, or around wow. the show anyway. Like um, so the, the, the Scott Derrickson, I really like Scott Derrickson. <laughs> See? Yeah. I really like Scott Derrickson. Right. I think he would have been good for this, to be fair, because he would have made a more horror vibe, much more horror than what Raimi did, quite frankly. Whatever you think of Raimi, it wasn't a horror film. So anyway, we have this. He left because of creative differences, and loads of people are always like, oh, it's amicable. Not really. It's never amicable. There's no such so, thing when you're parting. That's what I love about creative differences. Where we were oh, parting amicably. You're not, or you wouldn't be parting. Right. I know. Well, this is this is the hilarious thing. So he spoke to the playlist and he says, all I can say is what we said publicly is, is exactly the truth. We had real creative differences. You know, the movie I wanted to make and how I wanted to make it was different than it was just increasingly obvious that we were pulling against each other. And that's how you make a really bad movie, I think. When the producer or the studio and the filmmaker are making different movies, you end up with a monstrosity. And, you know, that's why I had to bounce. Wow. Pretty brutal, pretty down the line. I mean, he's saying things that we all know anyway, that, yeah, if you're pulling in constant different directions. But the take home from this is, and what we were talking about with Dan Trachtenberg writing a script and filming that script, this script would have been that well, one Scott Derrickson would have pitched an idea to them, so would, would have been hired, pitched an idea, and they gone, Yeah, cool, no worries, let's sign you up, whatever. It would have started to write the script, the script would have come together, it'd been you know, working with certain plot lines and, and how tonally, you know, they've got mood boards, loads of loads and loads of stuff with, with regards to this, and then all of a sudden, they're like, No, we don't like this now, we, we, need, we need to tone it down a little bit. And he's like, What the fuck is going on here? Why? It's this consistent thing with Marvel over and over and over and over and over again. And that's why you end up with just crap. Absolute crap. Um, so what did Derrickson uh, think about the movie? So he, he went to the Multiverse of Madness um, premiere. So he says, yeah, I went to the premiere. I'm still friends with Kevin Feige and everything. With me and Marvel is really cool. They invited me to the premiere and I went and I'm friends with Sam Raimi. I love Sam. So there's no bad, bad blood over that. They would have invited him just so it looked good. That would be the yeah. only reason he would have been invited. Well, and that doesn't mean that necessarily if they parted ways that they didn't like were still able to be on speaking terms. I'm not mm. saying that earlier, as I said, amicably. Oh, yeah. But I doubt he's going to come back and work for Marvel anytime fucking soon. Right? Never, I think. because Exactly. Like said, yeah. I was being facetious, but yeah. Yeah, well, it, it ever, because he even says it was an extreme departure from the first film, a genuine horror film of sorts, which well, is what, what I think people wanted. Well, and this is showing us a lot more about Marvel than anything, right? Like, I don't know, his movie could have been better, mm -hmm. um, but one thing we do know is that we have a, a creative leader who has gone off the rails, and... Under normal circumstances, I would be like, yeah, I mean, if you were going in a different direction than the creative runner of this franchise was going, then I'm sorry, you have to go. Obviously, Sam Raimi was going to go more in their direction. Unfortunately, I don't agree with that direction. So like, because mm. I'm more under the idea that the first 10 years of Marvel worked because you had Kevin Feige guiding that or at least making the final decisions on a lot of that. You know, and it's what got it there. And we've learned, you know, how it worked out be between, you know, being set up between John Favreau and those guys and then James Gunn coming in and kind of settling things in. And then from there on out, ever since he hasn't had those creative forces behind him, things mm. aren't as as good. And then you have the opposite of where James Gunn is trying to say that he's going to let uh, the creatives have all the control, which I think that's going to make a hodgepodge of craziness over on DC. It's going to be yeah. a exactly the same fucking thing we ran into with the Snyderverse all over again but anyway that being said yeah I, I, that's what i see here is that th he is basically telegraphing that a marvel is nothing but a fucking fiasco behind the scenes yeah b mm -hmm. you cannot work with them creatively you either do what they tell you to or you get the fuck out 
yeah, yeah. basically. And uh, yeah, that that's really what I, I'm learning from this is uh, that, that's how things work over there. Not that we didn't already know that, but it's just confirmation, just more confirmation. Well, you've got to actually add this to something I said earlier in mm -hmm. uh, this stream, right? So not only did he leave due to creative differences, Sam Raimi was on board and they did 32 rewrites of the fucking film. Yeah. <laughs> that we did get. Well, that's what oh. we're learning from the, <laughs> well, that's what we learned from the Victoria Alonso age of things is that nothing was ever set in stone, right? Prior to that, like James Gunn, for instance, sat down and he said 90 minutes, he had to map out the entire Infinity Saga for the movie side of things just so he could write, uh, write Guardians of the Galaxy properly. So he's the one who's supposedly responsible for the entire arc, Thanos arc how it was done in the movie site. Now I know he didn't write the original story. I'm saying he had to adapt it to the movies. Yeah. So he sat down and he, and he wrote basically an outline treatment of how all the movies were supposed to go between his film and infinity war. So they knew what the hell they were doing. Right. And that's kind of what you need is somebody to sit down and go, okay, this is where it goes. And when you got somebody coming in there, like Victoria Alonso going, well, maybe we should try this or can we do it in blue? Or how about we have him do this instead? Well, what if she comes around and she does this, you know, and you have somebody constantly changing things, then you get what we've seen out of Marvel up through Ant-Man specifically is endless re rewrites, endless reshoots, endless redoing of special effects. When the movie should be written, these movies should be done like animated films. I don't understand this, right? Like, and yeah. this is where getting rid of Ike Perlmutter probably costs them the most because he's the guy that's the penny pincher and said, no, 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 no. You're not spending yeah. all this money. You know, he, he's like $80 million. That's it. You know, fuck your, your $180 million budget bullshit, right? Like if you can't do it for $80 million, then I guess you're just not going to fucking do it now, aren't you? You need somebody in there saying that kind of stuff to these guys, because no, at the end of the day, you can't guarantee these things. Why are you spending that kind of money on Shang-Chi or the Eternals oh. or any of that shit? Right. And so, I was going to so, say this so, earlier, but 300, $300 million on the Marvels, mate. Exactly. And I was going to say this earlier, but I didn't get a chance to, but it's, it's, it's poignant here too. Is like, you know, at the end of the day, these movies, people have been asking us the one, one of the biggest questions we got for years was what is it going to take for Marvel or how many flops can they have before they go under? We now know the yeah. magic number. It's basically five, right? <laughs> like yeah, that's yeah. it. That's the number. People have asked us for years and it was pretty close to what we had said. It's going to take more than one, maybe two or three at the most. Then you'll start to see a decline. We started to see a direct direct decline right after Doctor Strange, taking mm. us back to this article. Why? Because instead of that movie being a fucking sequel to Doctor Strange and Spider-Man No Way Home, which was the most successful Marvel movie they had had since Endgame, and had, this movie was coming fresh off of with the same fucking character in, it was a sequel to your stupid Disney Plus show that nobody watched. Oh. You're right, that's on me. That's the problem. That's where this thing went off completely off the rails because that movie made $900 million. And outside of Guardians of the Galaxy, not one single Marvel movie has been able to bust through what, four or $500 million culture? Yeah, it's been very disappointing. That is a steep decline. It should have been a, a, a kind of a slope of sorts. No, it just went <laughs> off a cliff. And if you add in the problems they had before Shang-Chi and with Shang-Chi and all that kind of stuff, yeah, then it does you see the fall there. After Endgame, they basically have had nothing but flops. Saying Spider-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy. That's it. Well, and these numbers are not blowing up anybody's skirts. I mean, you know, you 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 look at the production budget versus earnings. Um, you know, and the and what the that's domestic just it. Box How off. much do they get to keep a, a Spider-Man money? We don't even know. Probably like 40%. Yeah, not much. I would say probably lower. Of their than percentage. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think Valiant, I think Valiant actually had those numbers. But when I look at it, I'm looking at okay, so Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania, because you made all great points. Uh 463 million. Uh Black Panda, Wakanda Forever, which got obviously additional funding from somewhere for tickets. Uh, made 853. Uh, Thor Love and Thunder at 760 did not break even. Um, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness was 952 million. Um, but that was again, uh, that, that one's questionable about if it made money or not. 
Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home was the big one, 1.9 billion. Eternals was 400 million. Shang Chi was 432 million. Black Widow was 379 million, and that includes the all extra access thing that they did on Disney Plus. Um, and then again, you go back to good films like uh, the Spider-Man franchise, um, and and you're back over a billion dollars again. I mean, you can tell like what is going to be about good. that for a minute though. That Spider-Man No Way Home made almost two billion dollars. And it probably costs what half of what Endgame it cost? Costs about two hundred million, a little bit over two hundred. Well, we know now how much Endgame cost. Yeah, Endgame like five hundred some million dollars. Yeah, and they're still yeah. misreport. They're still misreporting that budget everywhere, including. That's why I said numbers. some because we yeah. don't know the exact exact number, but it's, it's well over five hundred million. Yeah. So that's they spent over half of that on Spider Man, and it grossed almost as much as right. Yeah, and it's. Like you said, I mean, you you knew the duds were the duds, and again, it's still arguable about whether or not Black Panther: Wakanda Forever is even. It, it, All they've got left is Deadpool. Man, they are screwed. Yeah, I mean, and I, I guarantee you, this is yeah. the last Deadpool movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, Ant Ant Man: Quantum Mania was just such a disappointment. We're about to have a succession of them. Um, yeah. Well, that know, was the end of the road, right? Like that's how we kind of know that was where it met the end of the road. Sorry, go ahead. Nick. No, I'm. No, I was going to say that we we need to get uh we get Nick's thoughts. Uh, oh. We've got to shuffle on and say Nick. Nick, Nick has thoughts. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's funny how all this all started going down after Endgame ended, and they started these new phases. It seems like they had it all together, you know, back when Iron Man and Captain America and all that was going on, and. I'm just curious what happened to make the, all this just fall apart like this. Uh, because you never heard about people really leaving projects or creative differences or anything during there, that there, whole MCU. Yeah, there was Patty run. Jenkins left Thor The Dark World. Oh, did she? Yeah, she was, oh. on, she was on that. She was I, fired, I, I think, creative differences. Uh, I, I never heard anything about that, or I just forgot and don't remember. But uh, I'm pretty certain I'm right with that, am I, guys? Tom, do you know about that? I'm sorry, I did not catch the question. Patty Jenkins on Thor The Dark World, wasn't she? Oh, yeah, originally, yes. She was supposed to, and she left the project, supposedly, or yeah. it was a mutual parting of ways, as we were just talking. <laughs> Well, amicably, amicably, no, she well, trashed Marvel. They fired and, her. Yeah, no, I was kidding. I was being Marvel seems to be going the way of uh, Lucasfilm with, uh, you know, all these different people involved with Marvel projects, you know, leaving because of creative differences or what other differences they have or, or whatnot. Uh, and on top of that, like uh, everybody here has been saying, all these movies have been flopping. And I don't really see anything on their slate coming out other than possibly Deadpool 2 um, that is probably going to make them a single cent. Uh, so it's a freaking disaster over there at Marvel. And at yeah. this point, if I was in charge of Marvel at Disney, I'd be like, you know what? Whatever we have on the schedule you know, we'll finish these out, but after that, nothing else is happening. We are mm. going to sit down and reformulate a game plan moving forward. Um, you know, and not not greenlight anything until we have, uh, you know, a, a game plan in place and a path of where we want to take the story and new characters we want to bring in or any of that. I like I, I like Tom's idea where he was talking about you know kind of doing a soft reboot or, or whatnot and starting off in the sixties with the fantastic four, you know, and then uh, going through the, the time airs and bringing in X-Men and, and all that sort of stuff. So I, I think that's probably their best bet on kind of getting, getting Marvel back up there uh, and maybe getting people involved in these projects that are even interested I yeah. think I think that the problem is if you're going to reboot this you, you you do what Tom says and you 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 contract these actors for a decade. 
the next batch of actors. So you don't run into the problems that you're going to run into if you don't do that. Um, and then that way, if you get a good script or a good cast together for a particular type of project, you're able to keep them. Because I think mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of studios are going to be risk averse when it comes. Well, these to all should all be done by the Donner method, basically. And what I mean exactly. is, yeah. you, you bring in a bunch of nobody. fresh faced people that you, yeah. nobody really knows. Yeah. I don't want to say necessarily nobody, but you know, yeah, like kind of like what he's doing for Superman. That part so far, I haven't yeah. I, outside of him bringing in a bunch of other superheroes. I don't have an issue with uh, on the gun side of things. But like that's what you need to do on Marvel too. Is you bring in a bunch of fresh faces. You don't necessarily n have to know who they are you bring in your veterans in the parts that are only going to be in a movie or two tops, right? You don't, you bring in your, your bigger named actors to play like your Thunderbolt Rosses and stuff like that. Not your basic main characters, you know, but anyway, sorry, culture. I did not mean to disrupt you. You didn't, you're fine. I, you said better than what I was going to say. I just, <laughs> I, I, I was just, I was just agreeing with what you just wrapped up, which is you need to get, People you don't know, sign them to a 10 year, you know, you're going to make this, you're going to be this character, you know, and then see what happens. Uh, but then you have to make a good script. You have to write a good story and then you have to make a good movie. And it's hard to make a good movie. Ask anybody. It's really hard. It's, it's, it's like lightning striking. It's a one in 10 thing. There you go. That's all I had to add. No, I just I didn't want I didn't mean to interrupt you there. That's but my but yeah, also setting it throughout the decades, you you don't have to worry about modern shit either. This is true. It helps. Yeah, and if you if you inject a bunch of modern gar garbagiola into it, it will feel inauthentic and it will flop and fail. Yeah, basically. You know, and you know, and 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 like the the only shortcomings that I can point to, you know, in a recent creation that I've really enjoyed up and you know up until the well, we're coming up on the third episode is the Continental is not doing that. There is some garbage in it, but it's dismissible and ignorable. But you can't do that for a whole film. And we just lost the boss. Uh, the host. <laughs> <laughs>